I'm Parisi and I uh, will be speaking about this latest publication that we had. The title of the paper is A New Measurement of the Spin and Orbital Parameters of Centaur's X3 using AstroSAP. I have this on the title slide along with the customary acknowledgements down below. Um, this work was mostly carried out during my graduate school project, so in case if any one of you happen to be there then, and has seen this before, then um, I assure you I'm still, there's been a gap in between, so I can provide some new perspectives regardless. Centaur's X3 is a very famous source, a very prominent X-ray source, very bright in the sky and one of the first ones to have been discovered. It is known to be a high mass X-ray binary system, which means that it comprises of two components, one an X-ray component, which is known to be a neutron star, and then a high mass component, which is known to be a type O blue supergiant star. The X-rays are powered by accretion through Roche lobe overflow mechanism. It is an eclipsing X-ray binary. That means that uh, the neutron star gets eclipsed by its binary companion for about 10 hours every two days. This is an introductory infographic which I had prepared last year for the DSD of Sir Story Writing. Studying X-ray binary systems mostly means diagrams and um, artist impressions because these are compact objects, which means that the system is seen as a very tiny dot here in the center. Um, in this image which I've pulled out from the SIMBAD database, this is the optical image. Here the optical companion is seen. This is likewise for the infrared image as well. However, the system gets its due share of importance in the X-rays where the X-ray pulsar shines pretty bright at the same field of view. Um, thanks to last week's um, Ayuka seminar on the e Rosetta results, I also had a look at some of SRG's first light observations of X-ray pulsar centaurs X3. Here you can see that even this X-ray image is not, it doesn't stay put like this. If you uh, focus on the pixels here, then you can see how they grow first, become bright, then wane again, and then there's another peak here. So this variation is seen every five seconds, uh, and that is when the X-ray pulsar is not eclipsed. So a lot of uh, physics can be done with these systems. Um, but the imaging analysis takes, doesn't take us very far, so we require alternate techniques like timing analysis of its light curves. One can determine the type of components in the binary systems. One can characterize the spin, the orbital motion, see the eclipses, and also get insight into the mass transfer mechanism. Overall, all these um, uh, contribute to furthering our understanding of X-ray binaries and their evolution at a big picture level. I'll touch upon these one by one. Um, pre further to previous timing missions like the BEPOSACS and RxD missions, AstroSat was launched in 2015 with one of its main science goals being compact, the study of such compact objects, including neutron star X-ray binary systems like Centaurus X3, one of the major payloads on board is the Large Area X-ray Proportional Counter, or LAXP, in short. Mm, this is a set of three proportional counters that have high effective area and therefore boast of high timing resolution and sensitivity, therefore promising advanced timing capabilities. It tags every single photon which is detected with its energy, time, location of detection, etc., so there were about 20 million photons which were present in the initial data, which I've shown in this figure. AstroSat had a look at CentaurS X3 between 12th and 13th of December 2016. Uh, this data, as you can see, comprises of uh, individual time segments with gaps present in between. These gaps arise because uh, AstroSat uh, switches off uh, for some time while crossing the South Atlantic Anomaly region. Uh, every time in its orbit, and it is in a low Earth orbit and goes on, which there are, and there are 14 such orbits every day. Uh, some other reasons that can uh, produce these gaps is occultation of the 
source by the earth among various other reasons. This year I've bent the light curve at a 10 second level but a finer look uh, can be achieved by bending it about 0.1 second level. The finer look reveals um, pulsations. Visual inspection tells us that it is about at a 5 second long pulsations. I have um, pulled out this screenshot from the Nobel lecture in physics in 2002 where the Centaur's X3 pulsations were um, uh, exhibited from the early observations with the Uhuru mission and it was basically used uh, as an exemplary model representing all X-ray binary systems before discussing specific cases which are equally interesting because of their peculiar characteristics. Mm, the fact that we see pulsations is a signature of the compact object being a neutron star. X-ray binaries that have black holes in them do not exhibit pulsations. So this and the previous slide I have pulled out from my seminar for teachers at the Ayuka Kiravli Observatory on the National Science Day. And while the previous one establishes the pulsations, this one helps me quickly show you the binary nature of the pulsar, the overall X-ray flux when the same light curve is now binned at an hourly time interval, seems to increase, reach a maximum and then decrease back again, showing that the X-ray pulsar is moving towards us, reaching a distance of closest approach and then receiving away from us again. The eclipses are seen when the X-ray flux sharply falls to vanishingly small values for every 10 hours every two days, but uh, no such uh, drop has been seen in this light curve, indicating that the pulsar has indeed been observed when it has not been eclipsed by its companion. Further scientific timing analysis requires specialized software like the Kronos timing package belonging to the High Energy Astro uh, Astrophysics Software or HIASoft in short. LaxPCSoft is dedicated for LaxPC analysis and AstroSat utilities in general for AstroSat and in, for all payloads including LaxPC. One can quickly as, as have a spin period estimate a more quantitative um, uh, measure by taking the power density spectrum which exhibits a very sharp peak at 0.2085 hertz the reciprocal of which gives us a guess spin period estimate of about 4.79 seconds which is as per our expectation for Centaur's X3. Now one can, for further analysis one can um, exploit the pulsations and increase the signal to noise ratio by folding the light curve about a very precisely determined spin period value so that the pulses get stacked on top of each other. However, doing this straight away for a light curve that has gaps present in between provided, provides this jacked estimation of the spin period. Um, if one somehow still accepts it and takes this for example as the estimate value then one can see that folding and stacking will completely smear out the pulse profile. So the way one proceeds about this is then doing this separately for each of the 17 different time segments. I have shown one such example uh, here, but this was like 17 pairs. So here we have a smooth estimation of the spin period uh, and this folding, up, folding using the light curve only for that time segment. If, is, if it is folded about this value and the pulse profile stacked, then we have a very nice and smooth pulse profile with the prominent pulse peak and the secondary interpulse from the second pole. So this way we know that both the magnetic poles of the neutron star are contributing to the X-ray emission, which is observed. That was the broadband pulse profile, but this one I have resolved it into four different energy bands, starting from the lower energy band where the secondary interpulse is quite prominent, and then it seems to subside as we approach higher energy levels. So this is consistent with its distorted magnetic dipole um, configuration. Now when I look, have a look at these pulse profiles, um, sequentially starting from the lowest time interval and then going on to the 17th time segment then what is seen is this moves slightly towards the left and then comes back to the right indicating um, uh, that there is a systematic trend in this which is arising because the pulsar is moving in a binary orbit which needs to be subtracted because its motion can um, slightly produce a variation in our spin period measurements. 
This GIF was prepared by Vishal back in the library cluster office. He's familiar with customized GIF making, so I'd asked him to help me out with this. Um, the Doppler variation now, which arises due to um, circular, uh, 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 because of its binary motion, uh, makes uh, our spin period estimation um, a little slightly more complicated than it would have been. Initially, uh, when the pulsar is moving towards us, the spin frequency gets blue shifted, and then when the pulsar is moving away from us, red shifted. So one needs to account for this to compute the intrinsic spin period of this. The way it is done is by subtracting the motion in the binary orbit. This can be done, first of all, by estimating uh, the orbit to be a circle, because of which we expect a sinusoidal variation of the frequency about intrinsic spin period value. One must remember that even AstroSat itself is not stationary, so it's going out about the Earth, and the Earth is going around the Sun. So the way this is subtracted out is in a step called barycentric correction that refers every uh, AstroSat timestamp to the barycenter of the solar system, um, thus effectively uh, correcting for its motion. Now, if I calculate the spin uh, frequency uh, for different uh, time segments as I have and I plot them, then one can see that it indeed fairly follows the sinusoidal expectation, which means that the circular approximation um, really holds quite well. The pulses are narrower initially and then they broaden out as the pulsar moves away from us. The error bars are present in this measurement, but because we folded and stacked, the errors have gone so low that they are not uh, visible, but they're there. You can see there's a slight horizontal um, lines here. A uh, Levenberg Markart fit with the sinusoidal model helps us derive the values of orbital velocity and uh, period. However, uh, even subtracting for this effect uh, does not completely randomize the phase residuals observed, so there is still a systematic trend observed. This happens because the or orbit is not a perfect circle. There's a slight eccentricity, which I think Ranjit sir had asked me about in my viva. Back then I had said that the eccentricity is very low, 0 0.0005, which doesn't manifest in a major way because other systems have much eccentric orbits, but thanks to last year's um, Ayuka Colloquium by Professor Paul, I came to know that they had been able to uh, constrain the eccentricity to even lower values, and yet this minuscule value still shows up as this um, trend, which can be subtracted out. Uh, the fact that it is it has a periodicity of about half of the orbital period further confirms that this is due to the eccentricity of the orbit. Now, once this is also modeled and subtracted out, we, are, we have not only approximately um, accounted for the circular uh, orbit, but also its tiny deviations from perfect circularity. And the pulsar can now be um, uh, effectively considered to be held stationary at its closest approach point, where there is now no re relative motion between the pulsar and the astrosat for its entire observation duration. This, um, now one can see the binary uh, orbit being subtracted out completely, randomizes the residuals, and the RMS fluctuation also has dropped by about a factor of 2.5. On the other hand, this causes the pulse profiles to become completely coincident with one another, and I have also introduced an R, uh, manually a phase shift of 0.5 in order to better display them as per convention. Now, this table summarizes the results uh, containing the measured values of the spin and orbital parameters of CentOS X3. I'll go by them one by one. The pulsar spin here is indeed consistent with its expected spin up trend. However, the spin up time scale, while remaining consistent with, the, uh, with what is typical of beginning atmospheric Roche lobe overflow accretion mechanism, uh, seems to have doubled, so the spin period is higher than what would have been expected from its previous spin-up expectations. This deceleration in spin-up can be attributed to a variation in the transfer in angular momentum, which in turn can arise due to a variation in the mass accretion rate. This is accompanied with 
short time scale variations in its orbital decay that seem to manifest as a reduction in its orbital velocity, uh, orbital radius, while keeping the orbital velocity fairly similar. Uh, to conclude with, I'm using this poster which I had made earlier because the format of this poster helps me to summarize for you the main takeaway from this presentation, which is the new thing which we have observed. This retardation in the spin-up rate of the Centaur's X3 pulsar can typically arise due to negative torque effects in the innermost regions of the accretion disk. Similar work got published also very recently, where they too report evidence for inhomogeneous accretion flows in Centaur's X3 and ruling out other possible responsible mechanisms like the accretion of clumpy stellar wind uh, from a road slope overfilling supergiant. They also have concluded in favor of negative torques due to viscous drag in the inner accretion disk, thus providing independent confirmation for the conclusion which we ourselves drew from this work using AstroSat observations. Thank you all for your patient attention.